Hello everyone. Welcome to History Up Close here in the National Naval Aviation Museum. My name is Dwayne Thiessen. I'm the President and CEO of the Naval Aviation Museum Foundation. And the purpose of our foundation is to support this. You, join, you joined us here today, artifacts and some of the exhibits that we have here. With me today is my friend Donald and my friend Rhiannon, who are going to help me with this presentation. Each Tuesday and each Thursday at 11 o'clock, craft or an artifact that is associated with naval aviation, and we hope that you'll join us because we enjoy having people here, we enjoy talking about our exhibits, we enjoy sharing what we have with the public, and we look when you can. Now, since this is the first presentation, and since I was asked to do it, I get to choose, and I have chosen to talk about my favorite airplane of all the aircraft we have, and what I think is one of the most unique aircraft we have. Now, why is it my favorite? Well, I got to fly it. I started flying the Harrier in 1976. In fact, in 1983, I flew this very aircraft we have here displayed six times. It's in my logbook, and I enjoyed flying this aircraft immensely. It is a pilot's airplane. It is a lot of fun to fly, and I look forward to telling you about it. Now, in order to understand this airplane, keep in mind I told you it's my favorite. I told you it's unique. In order to understand it, we need to back up a little bit, let you look at this airplane, and I need to show you some of the unique aspects of the airplane, because in, until you understand that, you won't understand why it can do what it can do. So let's back up and look at the airplane a little bit. As you look at that airplane, the first thing you're going to notice, it has no tailpipe. There's no tailpipe. On a typical airplane, you have a tailpipe for each engine. On this airplane, which has one engine, you have four exhaust nozzles. You have two nozzles on each side. And we're going to be spending some time talking about that because that becomes very, very unique. You have a landing gear arrangement, landing configuration, or that landing gear configuration. But because the fuselage was so narrow, so slender, there wasn't room for a wide platform, so they put outriggers on the ends of the wings so that you had a more stable aircraft on the ground. That's a little unique. It's hard to show later on, but another unique feature I want to show you are these holes right here. They're called puffer ducts. They're at the top and the bottom of each wing the bottom of the nose, the bottom of the tail, and the sides of the tail. And we'll be talking more about that a little bit later on. Continuing with unique features, there's no tail hook. This airplane goes to ships at sea, but there's no tail hook. It doesn't need a tail hook because it can land vertically. And we'll also be talking about that a little bit more. Finally, what I want you to notice is that the airplane is really small. Now, some of you may be thinking, hey, you know, it looks pretty big to me, hanging from the ceiling up there. It was very small. The empty weight of this airplane was 13, a little over 13,000 pounds. Fully maximum weight allowed was about 25,000 pounds. Now you say, well, that's pretty, that's a lot of weight. Most of the aircraft that I'm surrounded with here have empty weights that are higher than the maximum weight allowed for that airplane. The real unique feature of that airplane 
is its design capability, what it was designed to be able to do. Now I need to travel with you around to go to the engine. This airplane was designed to fly conventionally like every other aircraft jet that you would be familiar with where the wing is carrying all of the weight of the aircraft. It was also designed to have the ability to hover where the wing is of the airplane and of the weight. Now to understand that, you have to, this is the Rolls Royce, and this is the reason that the Harrier can do. Okay, I told you it had four nozzles. On this engine, as it's displayed here, you see the back nozzles. The front nozzles have been taken off. All four nozzles are interconnected with a drive and a chain. So they all... The pilot has the ability to rotate these nozzles through about 90 degrees of arc. Now let me show you how that works. So the pilot can move the thrust straight down, or the pilot can move the thrust straight back. Now we're going to be talking more about that. We'll develop 21,500 pounds of thrust and no more. So theoretically, and develop more thrust than you weigh, you should be able to hover. Does that make sense? So, we're going to be talking a little bit about that. Now, what did I say it weighed empty? A little over the fuel and other things on that airplane. You still have about five to 6,000 pounds of ability to hover this airplane and control it. Now, we need to talk about controlling it a little bit. Control, keep in mind the thrust is down. If you can't control it, all this, you're just floating around. You have to be able to control it in time and space at any given time. So how does that work? How does that work? When the pilot puts the nozzles down, on the bottom of the engine is the pipe is a butterfly valve. When he puts the nozzles down, he opens and he pressurizes a reaction control system that you see here. That that air taken out of the engine is piped to the bottom and the top of the wings, the side and the bottom of the tail, and the bottom of the nose. Those are the puffer ducts that I showed you when we were on the other side of the airplane. Those puffer ducts are important because in a normal aircraft, when you want to go to the right, your aileron which raises, increases the lift and raises the left of those control surfaces up and down all day, it's not going to help you control the aircraft, except in this aircraft, what they've done, did the puffer ducts, those, those openings I showed you, that the pilot always uses anyway. The aileron is connected to the puffer duct on the wingtip. The rudder is connected to the puffer duct out the side fore and aft will move the stabilator for the pitch up or pitch down, but it will also open or close puffer ducts in the nose or the tail of the aircraft, giving you pitch control in a hover. Now, the control response in those two regimes are very, very different in the control, but they are the same controls. So once you understand which mode it's flying in, the pilot is able to fly this aircraft predictably without taking his hands off the controls or going to some other means of controlling the airplane. Now, let's talk about the controls and the capabilities of an airplane. Um, this is what I wanted to show you in the cockpit. We're going to go to the cockpit now, and we're going to talk about flight control. So, Donald, if you'll go into the uh, cockpit, 
and your your regular flight controls nose up. left wing down right wing down that's roll control that's like every other jet the yaw control is on the rudders which are down in the wheel wells down below the real magic happens right here this is called the throttle quadrant this is a throttle with the large black barrel assembly on it this is a throttle full forward is full power back is idle this nozzle the nozzle lever this lever when you move it back you move the nozzles down when you move it forward you point the nozzles back so when and this this thing here in the middle is a what's called a uh, nozzle stop or a stow stop this is so that you can set a predetermined nozzle flying and controlling the aircraft in some critical modes of flight so first let's talk about flying the way it normally occurs normally you're no, in a, in a, in an aircraft that you're all familiar with the nozzles or the tailpipe is pointed straight back your power goes forward to go faster comes back to go slower that's the way it is in a hover what you do is you bring the nozzles and as the wing as the lift comes off the wing you have to pick it up with the engine with the motor thrust and your power starts to come up now let's let's uh, talk about this just uh, a little bit and for that I'm going to have Donald uh, point his uh, camera at me here's your normal situation your normal flight you have thrust going back, the aircraft goes forward fast enough to generate lift off the wing, and the more thrust that you give, the more lift that you have. In a hover, the wing is not doing anything. Remember, the nozzles go down, and in order to have thrust, you have to increase the power proportional to the weight that you weigh, all right? Here, in this mode, it is strictly thrust driven. Here, it is strictly driven by the ability of the wing to generate lift. One of the amazing capabilities of the Harrier is that you have the ability to fly it between nozzles straight aft. In other words, you can generate lift on the wing to a point and then compensate with the rest that you need by going to the nozzles. Now let me show you how that works. Let's say that we're sitting here and we want to take off and we've determined that we want to do a 90 knot 65 degree nozzle takeoff. Well, the first thing we do is we set to 65 degrees. The next, yeah, the nozzle stop to 65 degrees. Okay. It's pausing on a couple times. Okay. Sir. The next thing we do is when we're ready to go, we go full power. When we see the airspeed indicator hit 90 knots, we, and away we go. As the airplane develops angle of attack or starts to fly, we nozzle out and fly conventionally. The result of this combination and this engine integration and this design created an airplane. The airplane could operate from very, very short runways. It could operate from a uh, ship without a catapult or a, an arresting gear. It could operate from a 96 by 96 foot of good quality concrete. It could operate from a two-lane highway as long as you didn't operate 
pressure across a, a greater surface over a period of time. Otherwise, you'd melt the asphalt. So we have traditionally operated, we have done a two-lane highway. So this is why I enjoyed flying the airplane. This is why I felt like the airplane was unique. And this is why I thought you would enjoy hearing about the airplanes out there. We have homeschoolers, and I hope you enjoyed that. And I know we've had some questions come in. And I know that I also have other people who have flown the Harrier who are grading me on what I'm saying. But I look forward to talking to all of you and seeing the questions that you might have. Let me move around back over here to the engine. And I think Rhiannon has some of the questions that you've been asking. We do connectivity issues, but we're going to take a few questions at this time. So feel free to post them in the feed below and we'll get to as many as we can and then we'll answer them um, following the Facebook Live. So Kira, she's eight years old and she asks, when was it made and what was it used for? The Harrier was designed in the 1960s the British started flying it operationally in the late 1960s and the airplane came into the Marine Corps about 1971 so it was the early 70s. Uh, the airplane was used primarily for a ground attack air support role. It had a fighter capability, you could put missiles on it, uh, but its primary function was ground attack. So we have another question from a user. Why did the AV-8C come before the AV-8B? <laughs> Great question. This airplane is actually an AV-8C. The AV-8C was a modified A. The AV-8B was actually on the, in, in design process before the C came out. So the AV-8B came out a little bit later and incidentally, the AV-8B, which is still in service today, had a phenomenal performance increase over the AV-8A. Twice the range or twice the payload. It had more thrust. It had a much more capable uh, uh, computer and uh, integration system for the pilot. It was a very, very fine aircraft. So, Bo asks, and he's 11 years old, how long does the vertical takeoff take? <laughs> All right, the less you weigh, but typically, once you put the nozzles down and bring the power up, the airplane kind of settles a little bit and then it just lurches straight up. It just takes a few seconds. It takes, it takes only slightly longer than it takes so we have a question from user TNT. The AV-8 Harrier has a lens in the nose for a camera. Did you ever practice taking pictures with your Harrier? <laughs> I know him. Okay, there was a lens, you're correct, but it was not a camera. It was a dual mode tracker. The pilot could track things on a TV camera or a laser spot. So it gave the pilot a chance to designate a target by either of those two means and help the computer on board the aircraft determine the parameters you needed to hit a target. Okay, we have a question. What is the, Amer have American Harriers ever shot down another aircraft? shot down uh, other aircraft in their battle against Argentina. Uh, the, Her the American Harrier, to my knowledge, uh, the airplane has been in OEF, OIF, and Southwest Asian conflict uh, from the very beginning. So we have another question from Blaze. He's 10 years old. When did they stop flying the airplane? So they haven't, but they will. 
The aircraft is going to be replaced by the F-35B, which is also a, a Stovall short takeoff vertical landing capable aircraft. That's what Stovall stands for. Right now, I think we're down to five squadrons, counting the uh, training squadron, uh, VMAT-203 uh, VMA and Cherry Point. So, and eventually stop flying the Harrier. How do you deal with high sea swells during landing? Okay, so the reason I believe that you're asking this question, who asked the question? Mr. Steve, Steve Hawkins. Hawkins. Steve Hawkins, okay. When you have a ship and you're in high seas, that ship is, and your landing on a ship is primarily done by visual reference points to that ship. If that ship points are moving and you end up moving the aircraft hand on. So the trick, the discipline required is to keep your eyes on the horizon to the best oriented and come straight down on a moving platform. Uh, it takes practice, but it's fairly intuitive once you understand how everything works. Scott asks, Drano, please tell us about the <laughs> Harrier and True Lies. True Lies. Okay. With Arnold Schwarzenegger, rescued a lady. What was her name? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> That airplane was actually an exterior model of a real Harrier. What they did is they took the actual Harrier and, and then put it together for the uh, studio scenes where they recreated some of the drama that you see in that movie. The flying scenes were actual aircraft flying. Uh, you, the flying scenes uh, where you see the airplane shooting it, etc. Those were actual aircraft flying. But, the, but him flying and rescuing uh, the lady that was uh, Jamie Lee Curtis, uh, that, was, uh, that was all studio production, but it was taken from a model made of an actual aircraft by casting around the exterior. So an another question, Arnold impression. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know what? I'll be back, but it won't be next week. It'll be the week after. Next week, you're going to have Sterles Gilliam, the director of this museum, talking to you about what he thinks. He'll be talking about his, his favorite aircraft. Uh, I guess that's Thursday of this week. Okay, so I'll be back with you next week. That's right. Join us this Thursday at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time for a tour of the Prowler aircraft with Museum Director Captain Sterling Gillum. Thank you everyone for watching and be sure to leave questions. <laughs>